Good afternoon, everyone. Everyone hear me okay out there? All right, good. Happy New Year. Welcome to our first event of 2019. It's great to see you all here. Uh, it may be a new year, but I'm still John Carlson. I'm still interim, <laughs> still interim director here at the center. Government's still shut down. And somehow, miraculously, Rudy Giuliani is still the president's personal attorney after all the things he said. Wow. <laughs> Anyway, I am delighted to welcome you all here to our lecture today by today's uh, Marshall speaker, Anthea uh, Butler. Uh, before we get started, just a little bit of uh, housekeeping. If you would, please uh, turn off your cell phones, your tablets, your boom boxes, your alarm systems, whatever you've got going on today. Um, and I'd like to give a special shout out to those who might be uh, watching online. Uh, hello out there. Uh, we are being uh, live streamed on ASU now. Uh, I think there are some students in the audience. Special welcome to you all. Uh, just wanted to let you know we will have a pause uh, at or before, I think, 2.45, 2.45 is when you all get out to make sure that you have a, uh, an opportunity to exit quietly. Um, but I would also encourage you to show your professor how smart you are and stick around and ask some questions during the Q&A period. And of course, after that, we break out the cookies. So there is an incentive for staying through the whole thing. Uh, and uh, most importantly as well, for, for everyone else, uh, we will be having a, a, a small reception outside. Um, I'd like to uh, let you all know about a couple of uh, things uh, coming up. Uh, our first, um, on February 20th, in, in this room, we'll have our uh, next installment in the Center's Lecture on Religion, Conflict, and Peace Studies, uh, our annual Peace Studies Lecture, supported by the Center's Hart Nikachos Peace Studies Endowment. And our guest is going to be Selma Leidesdorf, uh, a professor at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, she'll be discussing her re research on the Bosnian War in a lecture entitled Surviving Genocide, the Women of Srebrenica, and you may see some flyers around the uh, West Hall here um, advertising that event. Uh, and as always, you can find more uh, information about our events and other things going on at the center on our website. So I'd encourage you to check that out, or you can follow us on Facebook uh, or Twitter. Um, I have my own Twitter account if you're interested. It's at John D. Carlson. So uh, I'm told that I'm going to go viral at any minute now. So if you want to be one of the first people to say you're one of my first 15 followers, you better sign up quickly. So. <clears throat> Today's uh, lecture is part of our center's Maxine and Jonathan Marshall speaker series on religion and conflict. Uh, as dear, uh, dear friends of the center, the Marshalls endowed this uh, speaker series uh, as a reflection of their longstanding concerns uh, with uh, civic life and, uh, and, and the nourishing of our community locally and beyond. And while we remain grateful to Maxine and Jonathan Marshall uh, for their contributions, we are continually making new investments here in our center, in our students, in our faculty, our community, and, and we can only do that with the generous support uh, of our donors. Uh, so I just uh, want to take a moment to thank all of you who are friends of the center who are here with us today, those who have recently renewed their uh, friendship with the center over this uh, past uh, giving period. Thank you very, very much. It's so nice to have you here, and it's so important to have your ongoing support. Thank you. All right, uh, that's the pregame show. Uh, let's move to kickoff here. I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Uh, we are so pleased, so honored to have Anthea Butler. Uh, and I can tell you just how exciting this is. I'm on sabbatical right now. Right? And I came back for this, right? So I told Carolyn, hey, if we can get Anthea here, um, I know I'm on sabbatical next semester, but we're definitely, I'll, I'll be here, don't worry. So uh, she's here, and uh, her, her visit is supported in part by a grant from the Luce uh, ACLS program in religion, journalism, and international affairs, uh, through which we're bringing a number of journalists and, and public intellectuals to campus this, uh, this year. Uh, it's a project that brings together journalists and scholars who are interested or in religion to exchange different insights from their respective fields. And uh, we're particularly focusing on how religious actors, organizations uh, contribute to dem democratic life and culture, locally, nationally, and uh, internationally. Now, Anthea and I met uh, last year at an event related to this project, but we actually have some important connections that go back uh, well before then. Uh, she uh, did her PhD uh, with an advisor who was my professor when I was an undergraduate at Vanderbilt, uh, one, one Louis V. Baldwin. And um, 
that man taught me more about Martin Luther King than I ever thought it was possible to know. And I mentioned this in, in light of our celebration of MLK holiday this week. Uh, that was one of about probably three undergraduate classes that has stuck with me to this day. And I won't say how many days or years later that is, but uh, it's enough time. Uh, so I just I, I use that as a moment to uh, remind myself, to remind others that you know, if you think that one class or one professor can't really change your life or make a difference, uh, think again. So I'm uh, very indebted to uh, Professor Baldwin, and I'm sure uh, Anthea is as well. Uh, today, uh, Dr. Butler is going to be uh, speaking about some of her current research. Let me tell you a little bit about her. She's the Chair of Graduate Studies, Associate Professor of Religious Studies and Africana Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Her research and writing covers a range of topics, including um, religion and politics, religion and gender, African-American religion, sexuality, uh, media and popular culture. All great topics for the dinner table and every place else. Uh, her first book, uh, Women in the Church of God in Christ, uh, Making a Sanctified World, examined influential women within the largest Pentecostal denomination in America. But just to give you a sense of the range of her knowledge, uh, Professor Butler was uh, recently featured uh, on a CNN series on the popes of the Catholic Church. I don't know if any of you saw that. If you haven't, I'd go home and... Uh, Check it out on, on CNN. I'm sure they've got that archived or available. Really, really interesting study, and, and Anthea was on there uh, and interviewed extensively. She's also working on some other really important projects, some of which she's going to talk about today. Uh, but one is a, uh, a forthcoming book project entitled uh, From Palin to Trump, Evangelicals, Race, and Nationalism. And then, of course, she's working uh, on the project of our topic today, uh, through which uh, uh, is made possible also by a loose grant uh, that supports this investigation of the prosperity gospel churches, uh, particularly in Nigeria, uh, but some things that she's also comparing to our work today. As many of you know, evangelical voters played critical roles in the 2016 uh, U.S. presidential election, and something similar is happening again today in Nigeria, where they're soon to have their uh, presidential elections. Is it next month now? Yeah, next month. So prosperity theology, which was first incubated in the United States, has gained considerable strength in Nigeria, certainly strong enough to influence social policy, to turn political elections, and to begin reversing uh, missionizing, reverse missionizing in other countries. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing much more about these developments, as I'm sure many of you are as well. So please join me now in welcoming Prof Professor Anthea Butler speaking on prosperity, politics, and Pentecostal power in Nigeria. All right. I don't know. He used football metaphors for me, but he doesn't really know that um, I'm a crazy Eagles fan. And so, you know, don't I'm just, I don't hold it against me. And I just keep thinking about the fact that we're not going to be in the Super Bowl this year. So I'm trying not to think about football right now. We don't have to because this is going to be something. Yeah, exactly. So thank you, John, for inviting me to be the Maxine and Jonathan Marshall speaker in Religion and Conflict this year. I also want to thank your wonderful staff, Carolyn Forbes and Sarah Lords, for making this an easy trip. Although at times I was probably late with things to you because I was traveling so much in the fall semester. I, too, am on sabbatical. But sabbatical is never really sabbatical when you have, A, a grant, and B, you have to do some stuff, and C, you have graduate students. So it's never really sabbatical. It's just like a pause from teaching, basically. And I want to especially thank the ACLS for generously funding and loose for funding this project, which is why I asked for, I didn't mean to be rude, but asked no taping because I'm trying to figure out what to do with this right now. And it's going to appear someplace, and we know it's going to appear someplace sometime soon and probably a lot sooner than I think. So anyway, here we go. Um, I was going to start off my talk today a little bit differently, but as fate would have it, um, I had Wi-Fi on the plane yesterday. And I like to have Wi-Fi on the plane because when it gets bumpy, you can think about something else instead of what's going on with you at that particular time. And so I decided to look up some stuff about Nigeria just because I wanted to make sure about my talk. And yesterday, the Brookings Institute put out an article yesterday by Jennifer Adibe, a political scientist from Nigeria, which was titled, What to Expect from the 2019 Presidential Election in Nigeria. In that article, Adibe says the following, and I'm going to also apologize to every Nigerian or anybody else from Africa in the room because I'm terrible with names. Please count it on the fact that I'm from Texas. I don't know how to pronounce anything, okay? 
So you can come and correct me afterwards. Just know that I'm going to botch it up, okay? Because I just not, I have not gotten it down yet, and it's really hard. So DB says the following. A major feature of the February 2019 election is that, unlike in 2015, the two leading candidates are Fulani Muslims from northern Nigeria. In 2015, religion and region played major roles in determining the outcome of the election because Buhari, who is the current president, was pitted against Good Luck Jonathan, a Christian from the minority eth ethnic group in the South. In contrast, it is expected that religion and region will play insignificant roles in determining the outcome of the February election. Now, until I got to that part, I really liked the article because I thought, this is smart, this is good, and then I went, eh. As most religious studies scholars do, we're confronted with people who think that religion doesn't play a role in the election cycle. In my case, in this time, I would say that religion always plays a role in Nigerian life and in politics. Even if you can't see it, it's there. Religion permeates everything. And so the way in which I want to do this talk today is not so much to push against him, but I want to show you another lens of how to think about election cycles and what happens, because we know that here in the United States, religion affects elections a lot. And we knew that in the 2016 election because there were a whole group of people who came out of nowhere that people didn't understand. They were like, these are evangelicals, but they look like evangelicals we've ever seen before. Well, they weren't. They were prosperity gospel people. And so actually, 2016 here in the United States got me interested in why I wrote this particular project because there were a lot of Nigerian Americans who voted for Donald Trump. And I was trying to figure out why did that happen? And so that led me to start to think about what might be going on in Nigeria, especially with prosperity gospel, that might help to figure this out. Now, while these two candidates that you see here in the front, Muhammadu Buhari, who's the current president and the, the ADP candidate, and Alhaji Atiku Agbuka, a former VP and the People's Democratic, the PDP candidate, are both Muslims, there's religion going on here, okay? And so I want to just peel out uh, the one on the very left, which is Buhari. Nigerians resolve Buhari 2019. After healing comes greatness, just believe. Now, this healing word is a reference to something that I'm going to talk about a little bit later, and you're already smiling because you know where I'm going, um, about Buhari that we're going to say. Atiku's thing on the other side says reform, unity, competence, vision, peace, and prosperity. His big message has been about economic reforms and making everybody prosperous in Nigeria, which for anybody who believes in prosperity gospel, that's going to ring into them in a certain kind of way. Now, what are my reasons for disagreeing with this article? There are a few. The first reason is just because they're both Muslims doesn't mean that they're the same. Now, I think in this particular instance that there's three different things going on here that make this interesting election in Nigeria that's about to happen on February 12th powerful. The first is that the power that major Pentecostal pastors have in the nation to influence public morality and political policies. And what I mean by that is the ways in which their messages, the way that their followers go through, everything that happens influences not just the social milieu, but it does influence politics in a certain kind of way, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The second is the role of prophecy in the electoral cycle, and why in 2019, for the most part, these prophecies are muted, i.e. generalized and hedging their bets. In other words, people don't want to come out and say, so-and-so is going to win, or these other things are going to happen, because they're really not quite sure what's going to happen, which I think is very interesting and unlike what happened in the 2015 election. And then the third is ongoing tensions in the nation. You have Boko Haram in the north, Fulani herdsmen, who have been interacting with Christians in the north, and there have been a lot of killings and burnings of Christian churches, and the tensions of Christian pastors against Muslims' incursions by radical groups. In other words, what I heard a lot when I was there in October is that Christian pastors felt besieged. They felt besieged because they weren't sure about what was going to happen in the north. They, they had lost relatives. Um, the army has not been able to do anything about this. And if you remember back in 2015, when the uh, girls were kidnapped by Boko Haram, some of those girls still have not been returned and have not been seen. And so I just read an article two days ago about other girls who have been found in Mali that have been trafficked. And so this was under good luck Jonathan's um, basically presidency. But even then, even as a Pentecostal, he was able to do things. And so this has been an ongoing tension, I believe. Issues of escalating violence in Nigeria's Middle Belt, where because of the violence and doubling of fatalities, villagers have started to abandon their homes and flee for safety. So all of these things have compounded 
and made people think about what was go what's going to happen. And you've had different things around an event. But what I want to focus in on is about Pentecostalism in this talk, and because that's sort of where my focus is and the kinds of things that I've been doing. But first, I want to just show a little graph. And forgive me if I'm a little slow with this today, because Windows is not my platform. Um, this is a thing of projected religious affiliation of, for Nigeria, Pew, Global Cost of Global Religious Futures. And if you notice, the green is Muslims, 51%, and the Christians is 46.9%. Everybody else is almost depressed. And so you have really a nation that's about two relig big religious groups right now having to think about where they stand politically. And if you know anything about Nigeria, mostly northern Nigeria is, is, is predominantly Muslim. Southern Nigeria is predominantly Christian. And these two groups have had lots of different problems. And there's a long history about Nigeria and how it has formed. But what I'm interested in is especially um, this past year, and maybe since 1999, because that's where we can start to see this rise of Pentecostalism sort of overtake <coughs> the country and be able to do some things. But let's just look first at one of the characters that's running for president. And I think you're going to recognize something about him. This is Atiku Akbar. Notice that hat? Who's that man you of? Reminds you of MAGA hat, doesn't it? He's very smart. Now, he's PDP, People's Democratic Party. This is when I believe he was announcing for the presidency. Now, um, what is interesting to me about this is that he just showed up last week in Washington, D.C. And he stayed at the Trump Tower Hotel. Hmm. Now, how did that happen? Now, you're probably wondering, what does that have to do with anything? Well, it has a lot to do with something. Because first of all, he hasn't been able to come into the country for a very long time. And the reason why he hasn't been able to come into the country for a very long time is because of some things that happened. And because he signed a deal with one of Trump's people, specifically a place called Ballard Partners. And he signed up with them on September 21, 2018, to ink a contract with them for $1.1 million per year. Ballard is supposed to help Atiku to be able to advance democratic values and the rule of law in Nigeria. The contract required an immediate payment of $270,000 with another $270,000 due in late December. Now, he made both of those payments, and guess what? That visa happened, the visa that he hasn't been able to get for years. And all of a sudden, now he has a visa, and he comes into the country with much fanfare, meets with a lot of Nigerians in DC, and is staying at Trump Towers Hotel. Now, I'm not saying there's anything that happened about that. I'm just saying that this is very interesting that this has happened. Now, the other thing that's very interesting that has happened in the last few months is that the Nigerian president has had to say, it's really the real me. Now, why would you have to say something like that, that it's really you? He denies that he died and was replaced by a clone. Okay, Now, here we go. This is where the Pentecostal pastor comes in. There was a very big pastor, who I'm going to talk about in a minute, David Odekeo, who basically had a few things to say about this. And I'm going to show you a little bit of this clip. Hopefully, it's going to show on here. I have no idea this is going to work. Yes. Do I have sound is the question. All through ages. And I'm going to let this Prophets play Prophets are God's voice of the conscience to nations. And prophetic intervention is God's age-long solution for the rescue of any nation when never besieged by principles and powers, resulting in dehumanization and destruction of lives as we have it today in Nigeria. How can a nation with an army of intelligent citizens who are imparting the nations of the world with their knowledge, be a head spell bar like this country. How can the largest nation in the world be heading for perpetual slavery without people knowing it? Now, I'm not going to let this all play, but let me explain what was happening here in this clip so that you, you know. 
what happened in this clip was essentially that what he told to his very large congregation at Winter's Church was that there had been this rumor that had been put out in the news media that Buhari, because he had been very sick, had actually died in London, and that they found another man, uh, Jubril from Sudan, to pretend to be him. And that this person, who was really a Muslim from Sudan, was not the president, but he is standing in the place of the president. Now, if you think that that's far-fetched, think about all the conspiracy theories that we've had here about Obama being you know, a real a Muslim and everything else like that. And you could put that into the context of what is happening here. And so in his speech, he talked about basically that maybe this rumor was true, that Buhari was dead, and that this president, who we now had in Nigeria, was really Jubril El Sudan. And so this made a lot of news. And so unfortunately for Buhari, he had to respond to this. And that's when, in a speech in Poland, he said the following. Yes, there's uh, one important question. I, I, I seem to forget about it. Because uh, the answers of that uh, question must be ignorant and uh, irreligious. <laughs> so much as they so that I am grown. <laughs> uh, <laughs> No wonder I forgot it until I was reminded. <laughs> yes, I, um, a lot of people uh, uh, hoped that I, I was dead. <laughs> and hoped I died. And uh, poor uh, Vice President, I answered some people have started in fact asking for, for his office whether they should consider them for being the Vice President because I was dead. <laughs> they must have embarrassed him a lot because. Um, me uh, when, I, when I was in London conference, but uh, it's really me, I assure you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's sad that he had to actually, A, say he wasn't a clone. And I'm going to skip over just for a minute. So this is, this is the key to that. And I just want to pause it here for a second. Now, you're probably wondering, how does this happen? Well, one of the things that I found very interesting was this idea about prophecy. You heard um, the pastor talk about this at the beginning, what the role of prophecy is. One of the things that I discovered uh, when I started this research in Nigeria was that every year that there are many, 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 many pastors who come out with prophecies for the year. And some of these are printed out. Some of these are... Um, uh, distributed on places like YouTube through um, other kinds of means of videos and things like that. Some of these happen at New Year's Eve in churches. And a lot of these prophecies talk about the nation, talk about leaders that happen. And what it appears to me is that there's several things going on. One is, is that this is a way to be able to influence political activity without actually being political. In other words, you can blame everything on God. And it's a lot easier to say that God showed me something rather than it is to be political in the sense that we think about people being political here. In the United States kind of system, we have these parachurch organizations like Focus on the Family um, and others, American Family Association, that try to influence public policy through that. The way you influence public policy, I think, in Nigeria partially, is about being a prophet. You get to say some things that certainly can happen in this political realm. And so I think for sort of a political scientist, you might think, this has got to be the craziest thing you ever think about. We have ways to think about how we measure things. But I think that if you put in religion in the context, and specifically the proliferation of Pentecostalism into that thing, you can sort of think about how Pentecostalism is a way to influence the democratic process. If I'm thinking about political science, Ebenezer Obadari, who says the power of Pentecostal pastors to be able to view social political problems in spiritual terms is a way that Pentecostalism can influence the state and influence the way that things run. And so what I'm trying to do with my research this year is to watch this presidential campaign, first of all, to see what's happening. And then second, to understand why it is that certain kinds of ways in which these Pentecostal pastors are thinking about things influence people to maybe vote the way that they do, because they all have very large congregations. And the ways in which they say things about certain kind of political leaders and who you see uh, with other people. So if we notice here, that same Pastor Odepeo reveals what will happen in 2019, okay? And this is from one of the Nigerian newspapers where he is prophesying about the kinds of things that the prophecies for the nation and the church. And so he basically gave a generic kind of prophecy this year 
that said Nigeria is going to prosper, you in your personal life you will prosper, and that these kinds of things are going to happen. But it was very much not this way. Back in 2015, he was much more pointed about what he thought was going to happen and was very much backing the then president, uh, the president that was going to be before, good luck, Jonathan. And so the ways in which that happened was very different. And I think that we have to start to think about that. But why would somebody like this be a, a big person? Well, his church, Living Faith Church, Winner's Faith Church, is a very large church with a huge university called Covenant University. I had some pictures in there before, but I didn't want to take up all of this PowerPoint with a lot of the things. But it's the best private ni university in Nigeria. There's a great poster that I saw that said by 2022, they wanted to be right up there with Princeton, Yale, and Harvard, and other schools. I couldn't understand why Penn was not listed. Um, I was a little upset about that. I feel like I need to go to Nigeria and tell people, but like Penn is really good, right? It's an Ivy League too. But he sees himself in this space. Now, the way that I think about this church and, and this pa particular pastor is that he reminds me of old school health and wealth gospel. And so I want to explain what that is. Because the word prosperity gospel is something that we've been using maybe since the late 18, um, 1980s, maybe 88, 89. But this is a really an old teaching. And that old teaching comes out of Pentecostalism which is basically about health and wealth. That you can recite scriptures and you can have what you say. In other words, the, if God says I want to have health and I want to be healthy, you can have that. If I give my tithes and my offerings, then I'm going to see a return on that and God's going to give me something back. So these things that he's teaching about what we call prosperity are actually inflections from old teachers like Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, Oral Roberts is probably one that you know. And this is a really big thing and, and Nigeria right now with lots of large churches. You have large Catholic churches too, but prosperity gospel people are the ones that really have captured the zeitgeist of everything. And he's modeled himself, I think, a lot like Oral Roberts. He has a large school, he has a campus that has uh, banks and dorms and everything else, and they actually had a special prayer session for the nation on October 1st, 2018. And unfortunately, I got there a little bit too late to be able to get to that. But in these prayers for the nation that end up happening, they want to confront, and especially in Winner's Church, Winner's Faith Chapel, to confront all of the things that they believe that are wrong in Nigeria. So um, basically about corruption and things like this. I went to a Catholic church there the last Sunday in Lagos that I was there. And there's actually a prayer that's been said for years about corruption and all of these kinds of things in Nigeria that are prayed every week throughout Catholic churches in the nation because people are worried about the economic and social situation that they live in. Now, here's another person that's part of all this. And this picture is actually really important because it, to me it, it represents both this uh, connection between Nigeria and America. Uh, David Olipiepo, who I also talked about, the man in the middle who's the white guy, Morris Cirillo, is an old school health and wealth gospel preacher from America. He's been going to Nigeria for years. And this is at uh, President Osabanjo at the opening of Dunamis Church, which is now the largest church in Nigeria, which I'm going to show you a picture of in a minute. Now. What was interesting about this particular opening of the church that happened in November 18th was that good luck Jonathan, who's the former president, was also there. And I'm going to read a quote from him. He said, the Nigerian uh, story is identical to that of Israel. In some occasions, due to certain circumstances, the nation could go very low. Sometimes the people are taken captive and treated like slaves. But because some of the people are constantly praying for the nation from time to time, God will send somebody that will bring them out of captivity. Hint, hint. We all know that the circumstances in Nigeria today are not the best, but because of your prayers, Nigeria will be great again. All right, so he's already setting up a framework for you to think about what's going to happen in this election in the next few months. Now, the vice president, who's also a Pentecostal, okay, and not just a Pentecostal, but a Pentecostal pastor at one of the, the largest church, Redeemed Church of God, and he's still on staff. He's just like, I'm the president right now, the vice president right now but I'm still a pastor, and when I leave, I'm still going to be a pastor, okay? He says this, the iconic building called for celebration declared that the nation would not fail to prosper in coming years. I joined my older brother Jonathan in rank because he was president to declare on this pulpit that this nation will go from glory to glory, that all of us will experience the goodness of the Lord in this land, and the country will not fail but prosper, okay? Now, this is interesting because you have the former president and the current VP agreeing. Now, they both go to the same church. They're both redeemed church of God, okay? But there's a little bit of hedging the bets here. How do you know who's going to win next? Now, obviously, Osabanjo hopes 
that his man Buhari wins. And so what's been interesting to sort of watch in this sort of election cycle is what's being said, but what's not being said. And here's the church, so you can get a kind of a look at this. This is supposed to believe I see over 100,000. And I, I use this so you can get a sense of the largeness of scale about churches here in Nigeria right now. This is not just like, you know, you pass by here and you see a church of 10,000 people. We're talking about huge complexes like cities. And you'll see a couple of pictures in a minute from Pastor Enoch Adebode's church. These are complexes. This is actually in Abuja, which is now the capital of Nigeria. I was not able to go in here while I was there, but I need to tell you that this rivals anything that we have. So this moment that you start to think about America is the place that Christian, they're sending missionaries throughout the world, disabuse yourself of that notion. This is not what's happening. Nigerians are here. They've been all around you all this time in America, and they have really big, giant churches. They have a huge complex of Redeemed Church of God outside of Dallas, Texas, where they have a convocation every July. These pastors come to America. They have large congregations. There are large congregations right down the street from where I live in Philadelphia. These churches are everywhere. They have proliferated in a way that I basically said to somebody, one of my students, I said, they have put these prosperity preachers to shame in America because they have not been able to do the same kinds of things. And the amount of money and building, you obviously can do a lot of things that are not of to building codes there. And I'll show you a couple of complexes here in a minute. But this means it's not just about political power, it's social power. And if you have this kind of complex and you have that many people around you, these are constituencies that you can pull into an election cycle to vote for you. Now, this next picture is interesting because all the work that I did on my first book, when I first saw the pictures of them, I thought, these look like black pastors in the United States. This is Pastor Enoch Araboye and his wife, Fumuke Araboye, from Redeemed Church of God. Now, this is probably one of the older, larger churches in Nigeria. And you'll see some pictures of them in a minute, but he also had prophecies for 2019. But because he has the vice president in his church, his prophecies came out a little bit differently, and I'm going to play that for you. For the international scene, Joel chapter 2. From verse 28 to 32. For Nigeria, Lamentation chapter 3, verse 22 to 23. For individuals, I said chapter 3. Verse 10 to 11. And since everything is in quotes, for redeemed Christian Church of God, Psalm 91. All right. Now, he said everything is in code. So in other words, I'm not telling you anything specific. I want you to glean from Scripture on your own what this is going to be. I'm not going to say anything. So I find this very interesting that you have major leaders that are saying, I'm not going to say anything about this election cycle. I'm going to be very, I'm going to hedge my bets and be quiet. Now part of the reason why is because if you need to make sure you're going to be on the right side of things, you want to make sure that you can, you can be on either person's side who wins, right? So you don't want to be seen influencing it. But at the same time, you need to say something about what you think people's social situation will be. Now, it would be the same thing like if we read our horoscope on January 1 and it was for the whole year, right? Or if it was some other way to do that. But in Nigeria, this works in a different way. It works just both personally and it actually works corporately for the nation. These prophecies are really important in terms of how people are going to think. And if they say something about specific leaders, like what happened in Ghana with one particular uh, leader who said that a big imam was going to die, and then basically he, he got his church trashed the next day, because that ended up being in part of his prophecies, then you end up having problems. So you've got to figure out how to hedge your bets. But there's a reason why you want to hedge your bets if you're redeemed. You're one of the biggest churches in Nigeria. This is a picture from the front part. But what I want to show you is this new pavilion that they have that can seat all of these people. They say it's a million. I'm not sure. It looks really big when I was there. There was nobody there. But I know that on the first Friday of every month when they have their service, it basically ties up all the um, traffic in Lagos because you can't get out there because you need to be outside of the town and there's one bad road to get there. 
but it is a huge complex, and that complex has been there for a while. It's not just about a church, it's about a city. There are houses, there are homes there, and if I had more time to talk about this today, what I would tell you about is how that is all set up, and the amazing part is that it's gone on for over 30 years. But Hattaboya is not the only one that had prophecies. We also had prophecies from a man I'm personally interested in, T.B. Joshua. Prophet T.B. Joshua gave a message of prophecy for the nation, Nigeria. Let's hear what he said. Join me, pray for my nation. I have a message for my country, Nigeria. No, if the old thing is not where you, we cannot gather in Nigeria here. So there is a message and you pray. Nigeria, we should pray again a stopover. and pray for a smooth democracy. Open your lips and pray. Priez pour le Nigeria, qu'il y ait une démocratie. Ahora mismo, abre tus labios y empieza a orar por la nación de Nigeria. Únete en oración por Nigeria. Priez pour qu'il n'y ait pas d'arrêt, qu'il y ait une bonne démocratie. Pray against a stopover and pray for a smooth democracy. Now, what do I think he means by stopover? This is what I've been trying to figure out for the last couple of weeks here. I think what he means is I don't want this, I, I want things to continue as they are. I don't want this to change. I don't want there to be a stop that ends up making things different than what, what it is right now, okay? Because this is really important. Now, the thing about TB Joshua is he prides himself on having prophetic vision about other African leaders. So he said that he's, you know, come up with the person who was going to win in South Africa. He came up with the person that won in Kenya. And that has been his calling card throughout um, Africa about how many uh, prophecies that he's been able to give about presidents. So I find it very interesting, again, that he does not say anything about what he thinks is going to happen this particular election cycle. Now, that Tough might be because, excuse me, that he is over a church called Synagogue for All Nations. Now, unlike some of the other leaders, he's not denominational. In other words, he's not setting up churches like Redeemed Church of God. He's the guy, period. He is the prophet. And so um, one of the big things that happened in 2014 was a huge building collapse at his complex and his church in Nigeria. There's over 75 South Africans were killed, or 100, 100 people in total. And nothing has ever happened to him because of this, okay? He probably illegally built on top of this building that you see on the left-hand side and on the right. This was after the building collapsed. Um, I can tell you that there's still South Africans praying there now because when I visited this particular prayer garden complex that is a few miles away from where his church is right now, and if you see that round thing that's sitting out there in the middle, that's a nice helicopter pad, by the way. Or you can just fly from Lagos Airport right there, and you can be at the prayer garden complex they have an interesting thing that they do. Basically, what he does is that if you want to visit the church, you sign up online, you answer different questions, and then they will pick you up at the airport, they will take you to the lodgings that you saw, just like the ones that were in the building collapse, and you can be there for a week or two weeks and actually live on the premises and go to the services and be prayed for by the prophet and all of this other kind of thing, okay? So this is a, this is a big deal. He doesn't just have people in Nigeria that are following after him. They are actually coming from all places around the world, and so this prayer was actually quite amazing. All I could think about was that it was the biggest mosquito thing I ever thought <laughs> ever, because I just kept thinking about how many mosquitoes are going to bite me right now. But um, this was quite amazing because they were still working on it. And if you see that long building, that's the first building that's there, those are all like basically residential apartments. They're big dorms. And then, but if you're like a big Christian leader, um, you can have a very nice unit. And the master unit actually had a sauna and a climate room. I don't know why you needed a sauna, but it was pretty nice. And um, <clears throat> there's actually um, boats and things that you can take out on the lake. So these pastors are not just doing little church things and collecting 10% of your tithe. They're building empires. But the most interesting pastor that I talked to there that really kind of made me think about what it was like to think about um, what these political things might be is Apostle Ansel Matabuko. Now, he's a much smaller pastor there, but I want to play a little audio of him because I think this will tell you everything you want to know, and hopefully the audio will come up. If not... I'll have to tell you. Mm -hmm. you know, because we are blacks and we think that yeah. we've bought the lie that this is you know, blacks mm -hmm. are democrats and all that. But so lie that blacks are I, I know that I, I knew that if God still loved America, mm -hmm. if God had plans for America, yeah. then that system will not continue. 
Mm. I knew Clinton would never be the president because mm. if she became the president, then America is gone. Uh -huh. That's completely out of God's plan. Okay. But I could see uh, this new world order, that's what they represent, Illuminati yes. and all that. I see that the, the strong hangs on, on mm -hmm. those people and they try to use them to push, push it, yeah. that to the world. Mm -hmm. you know? so, so Trump's entry into the whole thing now disturbed and that's why he, everybody's against him. Yeah. All the press, all the almost, almost the whole so world. So it didn't upset. So I have to ask this question because this is really important. It didn't upset you when Trump called Nigeria. He said, "This is an asshole country." It's the truth. It's yeah. the truth. Okay. So you, for you, it was like he is telling the truth. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, so there were so many Americans who were upset. Oh, how can you say this? Yeah, but that, 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 he was right. This is more yeah. than that, you know. So okay. That's not the working here. We have everything. Yeah. So uh, we are, we are, we're a blessed nation, we have oil, we have minerals, we have yeah. people. Just a few people seize the assets of this country and just making us look like, not, like animals. Mm. You know? So we are worse than what Trump said. Yeah. You know? I don't believe we should fool ourselves. If you couldn't understand what he just said, and I'm just going to talk from now on. If you couldn't understand what he said, and basically I asked him was, you know, about Trump saying what Nigeria was supposed to be an asshole country. He said, yes, Nigeria is a shithole country. And I went, huh? Because I couldn't believe it. I just, you know, I didn't, do, I didn't know. But the way that he framed his conversation with me was about, how, in a way, just how people talk about politics here in terms of conservatism. And the way he said it is that here, I didn't want to see Hillary Clinton become president of your country because I thought that she was an immoral person. I thought she wanted abortion. I thought she wanted all these things. This was not good. And this was better because Trump is a man of God. And he's a man of God because God has blessed him. He has money. He's going to bring prosperity to your nation. And this is the man that God has chosen, OK? And so for me, that was a revelation in a minute, because it was like, OK, I know people voted for him here. But to hear him talked about in such a reverential way when I was in Nigeria really started me to think about what, what is going on here with Pentecostalism. So for the last portion of this talk, I just want to talk a little bit about what I think is happening with Pentecostalism and why we have to look at this in a, in a different kind of way. And I think the first reason why we have to think about it is because there are mechanisms within Pentecostal belief that help you to be able to become I would say either more rigid or more nationalistic or uh, much more in tune with governmental structures that are rigid. And so one of those things is about morality. What happens in Pentecostal morality is that you usually don't want people who to smoke. You don't want people who have engaged in premarital sex. You don't want, you won't have people who are engaged with um, education. You want people to have money. And those kinds of things speak to some of the big um, questions that are raised in a place like Nigeria that has an enormous amount of wealth and enormous amount of poverty. And so I think one of the reasons why these pastors do so well is that they were able to articulate a sort of a theology of not just faith and belief and prosperity, but how you can be prosperous in the midst of situations that are not, um, that are not conducive to prosperity. In other words, if there's violence and all this stuff, there are ways to protect yourself. Second of all, these kind of Pentecostal beliefs really mesh well if you, if you come from a, a sort of a background that is miracle-based. And so if we talk about this in the Latin American context, a lot of the Pentecostals who came into Pentecostalism came out of Catholicism. And one of the things in Catholicism is, is that you have miracles and belief because you believe that if you pray to saints, you can be miraculously healed, things can prosper for you. And so that's another way to think about this. A third way, I think, is that Pentecostal pastors have become very popular and very prominent. Um, there are pastors there who have lots and lots and lots of money. And it doesn't mean that you have to be a very big pastor to do that. I spoke with uh, a young man who calls himself the Oracle, Chris Okafor, in about 2013, 2014. He was um, preaching in the northern part of Nigeria. He was kidnapped. Um, some people thought it was fake. His church obviously thought it was real. They paid a huge ransom for him. I spoke with him when I was there in Nigeria, and he's buying up a large section of the community that he lives in. And I was uh, interested to note that he said, well, I don't really need a lot of things. But behind his desk was a picture of him and T.D. Jakes. And so this was sort of the American connection. He's like, I, I said, so how do you feel about T.D. Jakes? He said, T.D. Jakes is my spiritual father. This is a person who's helped me think through things. And I come to Dallas all the time. I think about these things. And so I'm like, ah, oh, this is this connection here, right? So in December of this year, two days after Christmas, there was a very big picture of him blown up everywhere. And he had just bought his first Learjet. Now, he's a little behind. There's a couple of pastors that have more than two. 
Okay, so he's at least made it into this sort of realm of where she has a Learjet. So this, this idea of prosperity and putting that prosperity out there is in competition with people who are also very rich that have made money out of oil and minerals and other kinds of things, but also a community in which you have a lot of poverty. The third thing I think which is interesting about this from a media perspective is that, and I talked a little bit about this when we were at lunch today, is a media perspective about what, what is coming into Nigeria. And one of the things that I found out when I was there that I did not know, and what really was interesting to me in terms of somebody who looks at religion and media, is because their cable comes from South Africa a lot. And so they've had two television stations that started off really early, but the cable that they got came from South Africa, and one of the stu stations that they got was Fox News. And so when I attended a Catholic mass my last Sunday in Lagos, a Yoruba uh, mass with the Igbo priest, the, it was a Sunday that was about marriage, and he talked about Adam and Eve and everything, and he said, you know, this fake news that's everywhere, and I'm like, ooh, am I home? And this is, we're talking about fake news and I'm in Lagos, right? And the, the whole sermon, homily, for about 30 minutes was framed just like I would expect a Catholic priest to say here that was conservative. It wasn't that much different. He talked about the evils of homosexuality. He talked about how this, you know, marriage was between a man and a woman and it shouldn't be against, between anybody else. I expected that. But I didn't quite expect the harder line, which was that if you're having problems in your marriage, you should just pray about it, see the priest, but you're just not praying hard enough and that you should stay. And so I had to start to think about, and one of the things that this project has done for me is to start to think about these lines of connection. And one of the things I would definitely say about Nigeria is that even though there are some of these Western ideas coming in, what I think and what is important to sort of realize about the Nigerian context is that you have a lot more, um, how do I want to put this in a nice way? Pentecostalism is much more powerful in this particular context than it ever was in, in American context. It may come out of historically out of here, but the ways in which it has really gotten into Nigeria and has changed the Nigerian landscape about religion is amazing. I heard people tell me that this has made it very different, and I don't know this by, I only know this anecdotally, um, it has changed it very much for even the Muslims that are there, because in order to get younger people into the services, you have to have a much more charismatic imam. You cannot have somebody who is non-charismatic because Pentecostal preachers are able to lay hands on people, they're able to cast out devils. Even the Catholic priests look like evangelicals right now. And so it's very hard to discern this. But the second part of this, I think, it's changed the way you have to think politically because now what you have in this particular election cycle is sort of a tiptoeing around religion for all of these leaders and they're not being very prophetic, but that just even just a little thing, if Boko Haram does something, if there are more Christians who die because Fulani herdsmen do something, the tensions that I heard from pastors there who talked about this Christian Muslim tension, that is going to be something. And I think even with two, you know, there's 73 people running right now for the Nigerian presidency, okay? So let's not be real. I've just showed you the two biggest, okay? But there's 71 other people who are running. They probably don't have a chance, but they're not going to get up there. These two men who are running, even though they're Muslim, know that they have to please the Christian community and that this Christian community is largely Pentecostal. In Buhari's case, he has it a lot easier. He's got a vice president who's already Pentecostal. Atiku's case, I'm not quite sure what's going to happen. But I think his connections with Trump will make something for very interesting. And so for the next three weeks, I would just ask you to pay close attention to Nigeria. Pay attention to what this presidential election looks like. Because I think that it may have some surprising things that happen. But even if you don't think religion is a part of it, it's very much a part of it, and it's very much a part of the fabric of everyday life in Nigeria. Thank you. And I was trying to be respectful of time, so I don't know where I'm at. You are in a great place. Okay, we good. absolutely have time for questions. Uh, if you would, please raise your hand. I'm going to bring the microphone around, and I'm going to ask uh, Sarah to help us. I might take uh, up my jacket the... because I was like, I didn't know how hot it was going to be, but it's hot. <laughs> and don't mind me if I need to have a bad meeting. Okay. All right. Here we go. Uh, please, if you would, just say your name. And uh... My name is Lika Romney, and I would like to know where Boko Haram fits in there. And mm -hmm. my second question is, how come English is the language? Oh, that's a historical question. I can deal with the first one very easily, the English. You know, you had Nigerian was, was ruled by English for a very long time. And so, so that's, that's why English is a traditional language. But you have lots of, you have tons of different languages that are there in terms of dialects and Igbo and all Not just this. one. Yeah, not just one. And, and also Pidgin English. So there's even a Pidgin English in BBC. 
So, I, which I kind of look at every now and then because I'm like, I'm trying to learn it better and I don't have it done yet, but I'm getting there. And you know, Boko Haram fits into this this way. I mean, Boko Haram is a problem in Nigeria. You have a, you have a basically a, a group of, you know, Muslims who don't want, you know, Western life, basically. That's part of what the name means. They don't want Westernization, they don't want education, they don't want any of this stuff. And so they have been able to take a foothold, and part of the problem, is, and people, there are people who know much more about this than I do, part of the problem is that the government has not been able to do anything. So I'll give you an example, um, and I'm going to forget his name right now, but one of the government, somebody very large in the army, they've not heard from him since an incursion back in November. They haven't even told his family what happened. They don't know where he is. I'm going to assume that he's dead. But this is a this is a huge problem because basically, the, you know, there's these incursions that happen. You know, whether they kidnap girls or they're killing people, or they bomb something. You know, they might have a suicide bomb or something that comes into Abuja or someplace like this. This creates havoc in the northern part of the country. But this is also pushing some of the Pentecostal pastors to have the same kind of rhetoric that Pentecostal pastors have here about Muslims. They're horrible people. It's a violent religion. All of this stuff. So this same kind of rhetoric that you might hear from somebody like, um, I'm forgetting her name, Pamela, whatever her name is here. Um, you hear from anti-Muslim groups here, you hear that in Nigeria too. And so what I think is that it's a very interesting, it's a fine line between you know, basically peace and something really bad happening. So I'm hoping that nothing happens in the next three weeks so they can, they can have free and fair elections. But there's also a lot of talk about um, Buhari rigging the election. So that's a, that's a big thing right now that's also a, a huge conversation. And I'm not going to pretend to understand all of it. I'm just really focusing in on the religion piece. And tell me your name, too, when you come out. Yeah, my name is uh, Aaron Agoso. I'm from the English department. I'm okay. from Ghana, yeah. actually. Um, I think last year or last two years, I'm not too sure, Paul Kagami in, in Rwanda mm -hmm. banned about 6,000 churches you know, it was recorded, mm -hmm. and uh, demanding that um, pastors, in fact, even banned some Muslim churches, uh, Muslim mm -hmm. mocks too, I mean, yeah. and demanding that those who manage these facilities should prove that they have at least a degree in, in theology mm -hmm. and then in, in whatever religious studies. Yeah. Um, and his argument was that he has seen religion as, as impoverishing his nation mm. and indeed a continent of Africa. Now my question is, do you see religion as a threat to the decolonization process? Thank you. I'm a religious studies professor. Religion is my business. So whether it's a threat or not, I'm gonna talk about it. So, you know, this is this is something I said at lunch, you know. You can talk about whether religion is good or bad for people, but you can, but I deal with the facts. What happens? I'm a scholar. So you know, the crazier it gets, probably the more interested I'm going to be in you, right? But, you know, I, I want to say something about Kadami because I think this is actually interesting, what he's saying. What he probably should have done at the beginning was never to let, um, what's his name, from Saddleback Church come over there and give them the purpose-driven life. Do you remember this? Do you remember when everybody went over, he went over there? And uh, Rick, why can't I call it? Rick Warren, thank you. Rick Warren went over and gave everybody the book, The Purpose-Driven Life, and they had purpose-driven life all over the country. This was a way to try to make them become like something that like was West, right? And so it just changed everything. I mean, in my part, if I'm thinking about Nigeria, one of the things I worry about in that particular context is how you know, Christianity is wiping out traditional religions or you know, traditional ways of people thinking about their lives, the kinds of things that have sustained people for centuries are going away because you have this, this kind of radical kind of Christianity coming in and changing everything. Now, in Kagami's case, what he's trying to say is, I don't want anybody to be uneducated. Now, I don't know what the rest of that is, if he wants them to have a certain kind of education or not. So, yes, religion can be bad and good. I mean, there's, there's all of that. I, that, is, that is not my job that I do. I'm a historian. I'm a religious studies person. So I'm going to look at it no matter what. But I will say this. It, whether you think about you know, that situation there, or you think about the situation in Nigeria, whether we think about what's happening with Narendra Modi, there's, there are places in the world right now that we really need to pay attention more to religion. And that's part of what this grant is about, is to get people actually to think about that more in the press. And I think we have to think about that more here, because people did not understand what happened in the 2016 election. They could not understand those people who came around Trump. They didn't know who Paula White was. They didn't know who any of these characters were. But they were characters that some of us knew very well. 
And we could see what was going on. We could see how these, you know, this wasn't the traditional evangelical like the James Dobson. This was these Pentecostals who came in, who have a different kind of way of thinking and a different kind of way of being. And that just changed the whole trajectory of that election. And most of the people who voted for Trump were actually finding out these are people who call themselves Christian but don't go to church. And I call them NASCAR Christians because they basically like NASCAR, but, and they like Jesus, and they like the flag, but they don't want to see a church. <laughs> so in the American context, that's what I think about them as. Okay, uh, my name is O.K. Uh, is it on? Look at around. Uh, O.K. Ihe uh, in the School of Politics and Global Studies here at ASU. Thanks for a fascinating uh, lecture. I'm not sure I have questions, but just a few uh, comments to, mm -hmm. uh, in line with what, what you pointed out. T.B. Joshua, Yeah. what he meant by... Yeah, help me with this. I yes. thought you might know. <laughs> what he meant by stopover. Mm -hmm. um, he's not well lettered, so but he's using stopover. He has a historical mm -hmm. basis for that. Okay. Uh, in 1993, presidential election was uh -huh. annulled by the military. Ah, okay. So because the... The person that emerged the winner mm -hmm. wasn't the person they liked. Uh -huh. And so there is a palpable feeling in Nigeria mm -hmm. today that uh, things could go wrong. Buhari might try to rig yeah, the election, mm -hmm. and some uh, segments of the military might intervene. Ah, so he means that he doesn't yes, want military does, intervention. Uh, yes, or any kind of hijacking mm -hmm. of the uh, yeah. political system in Nigeria. Um, it's only partially right then. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, then it's, it's, you're right in saying that other religious groups are responding to Pentecostals mm -hmm. uh, in order to retain or maintain their uh, congregation, they have to copy them. They call, it's called Pentecostalization yes. of both Islam and mm -hmm. Catholicism and mainline Christian religious groups. Everyone is doing it. But my third point, I, I, th I think I disagree with you in terms mm -hmm. of Pentecostalism and democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, in the 1990s, there was this euphoria yeah. that Pentecostalism was going to change the democratic practice in Africa. Uh, they were going to influence the democratic process. But uh, you, the euphoria has waned. Yeah. Uh, they're not, it hasn't panned out that way. Yeah. A Pentecostal pastor is Nigeria's vice president. It hasn't changed much. Mm -hmm. uh, so religion will play a role, but mm -hmm. as for whether these huge churches or groups will uh, change mm -hmm. the electoral outcome, there's a, a serious doubt about that because yeah. particularly these Pentecostal churches, their leaders mm -hmm. have a tendency to be elitist, to be authoritarian, mm -hmm. to I'll be in alliance with those who are yes. actually perpetrating the and problems. And that's actually my point, yeah. because I didn't so. really, if you think I'm saying Pentecostalism mm -hmm. is great about democracy, mm -hmm. you heard me wrong. Okay. <laughs> okay, I want to do that right now. I actually think that, Demo that Pentecostalism is really great if you want a dictator. Oh, okay. Okay. And, 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 and that's actually mm -hmm. what's happening right here, right now. Exactly. Is and that, so, that, and yeah. that if you want, because Pentecostalism is all about hard boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. You don't smoke. You don't drink. Mm -hmm. You don't go with girls who do, mm -hmm. right? And you have hard boundaries about everything. So if you have hard boundaries, it's a lot easier to take on somebody who's a dictator. So that's one. What I do think is interesting to me, and I, I, I don't disagree with you. I think that one of the things that's interesting to me is that although these men have a lot of money, they also have a lot of people sitting in their seats. And whatever they do, their people are going to do, mm -hmm. which is dictator-like, yeah. right? So you, take, you have a whole bunch of people. And so this whole hedging of the bets right now mm -hmm. is very interesting to me because normally they would just say something, right? Exactly. That, and I mm -hmm. think that's very interesting that they're not saying anything yeah, right they're now. they're not saying anything. And one of the things that, the, one of, and I'll shut up here. No, no, is okay. the, we can talk afterwards. The, the Pentecostalization of other religious mm -hmm. groups and Pentecostalism is leading to closing the debate. Yeah. No, I think and so uh, you're right. Then there's a fear then that mm -hmm. this society, the entire population is being prepped up to sustain, mm -hmm. uh, to support authoritarian regimes. Yeah. But Donald Trump is so popular in Nigeria. I know, it's crazy to That me. you can't have conversation with family right. members. Yeah, yeah, you uh, can't. When you tell them, 
Mm-hmm. Which Donald Trump? Uh, yeah, exactly. You can't, you, 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 can't, you can't have that conversation. That's what I thought. This is what started the whole thing for me. You, you understand, right? This is what started it, because I couldn't, I couldn't put it together. And until I went and I started talking to people, then I went, oh, OK. You know, I used to, I mean, my, my silly thing was I just thought, well, maybe they like all the gold in his apartments because it looks like the gold on TBN. <laughs> but but that, was, that was just a, a silly observation, but they had some truth into it. So, but thank you. I really appreciate your comments. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, thanks. My name's Edward. Um, the question that I have for you comes from a, a business perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, this past week, I was just cruising around on YouTube, mm-hmm. and there was something called the DLD 2019 conference. Mm-hmm. And they had a group of young Nigerian mm-hmm. businessmen men and women. Mm-hmm. And um, the young man was probably about 30 years old. Mm-hmm. And the concept that he, he said, um, any howness. He goes, in, in Nigeria, we have this concept called any howness. Mm-hmm. So one, have you heard of it? And then how does the concept of any howness fit in with Pentecostal teaching? I don't know that one. You might, do you have anything you want to say? Because I, this I don't know. This I don't know. I'm not sure what is referring, but I know this in, in pigeon. Uh-huh. Yeah, I was going to say this might be pigeon in Indus. Yeah. Balance, say anyhow. Uh-huh. Okay, anyhow means we, well, whatever it is. Oh, despite everything. Despite everything. Okay, so I'm not sure how that relates to. Yeah, I'd have to see more of that whole conference page. Maybe you might want to show me afterwards. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm not sure about this at all. I mean, I think, you know, I, I think what to me is interesting, since you say there's a young people, I think, you know, and I'd be interested to hear what you have to say too, as I have a sense from younger Nigerian people that this, this whole religious complex is, is wearing them down somewhat, right? And that they're not, like millennials here, they're not interested in this organized religion. They're not interested in giving all of their money and their time to people who are taking it and not giving them anything in return. And I also think that with you know more education comes more knowledge, and that you're not apt to be in those same kind of circles. And so I think you know they're going to run into the same problems that we're running into here, in churches, and how people are thinking about not going to church, and millennials don't care about that, or they say I'm spiritual, but I don't want to be bothered with all of that. So I think that's going to be a difference for them too. I don't know where we're going next. Who pointed? Okay, we'll do Tracy, and then we'll circle. Okay. Thank you, Anthea. Uh, I so admire your ethnographic composure in mm-hmm. interviewing that um, uh, that man we heard from. I kept my mouth straight a lot of times. <laughs> I um, I'm wondering if what you see here in uh, Nigeria in the way mm-hmm. of signs and portents for Trump's relationship with African Americans, uh, including mm-hmm. Nigerian Americans, but African Americans more generally. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I honestly, I mean, I actually think that he's going to have a better relationship with Nigerian, Nigerians overall than he's ever going to have with us. Because he can, there's something that, I just think that for African Americans, the African Americans who are here, who are evangelical, who voted for Trump, and there are a few, you know, we're going to be with Trump because they're part of this kind of evangelical group, right? And that they knew this. But I think for the majority of African Americans, they just really are not for him. And this is going to show up in the 2020 election, you know, very strongly. It's already showed up in 2018. I mean, look at the amount of women and, and uh, people, women of color who came into the Congress this time around. You know, think about what happened in your own state. I mean, this is like really interesting. And I think it's a portent of what's going to happen with the Republicans in 2020. Now, the question is, is, can Donald Trump look up from everything else that's happening with him right now to be able to do this? And right now, the way that Donald Trump is trying to think is he uses his evangelical coalition to prop him up. So when things are going badly, they all Trump to the White House or they get to Trump Hotel. Okay, because that's where he likes to bring people or, you know, put them around so that they can bolster him and that gives him some good press. I think, you know, if Tika wins, that could probably happen. That might be, that might be a country you see him going to, even though he'll be like freaked out and trying to get McDonald's every day. And I, that's going to, I don't know how it's going to work out for him. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, yeah, I, I, Mr. Bean. 
this Mr. Biggs, yes, I went to Mr. Biggs, actually, because you know I had to go, because it reminded, I won't talk about what it, Mr. Biggs reminded me of, but anyway, it reminded me of Ron Isley, if you're, for those of you who don't know. Um, it, was, it, it was a whole other thing, right? I just don't know how he would function there. But I do think that one of the things he might do, whether it's, you know, his wife just went on that whole African tour, right? You know, the first lady went on that whole African tour where the elephant tried to poke her and everything else. But, you know, and she didn't know what to do, and the kids that were holding, the kids were like looking at her like, we don't know, you know? So, I mean, I think there's a sense in which American presidents try to make that move all the time for different reasons, you know, and it looks for different ways. I just don't know at this point, because we know that he doesn't have that kind of relationship with Latin America. So, you know, Asia has been the place that he's wanted to go to the most because that's easier for him to do, right? So it remains to be seen. I would, I would guess maybe, but I don't know that he can withstand all the rest of the stuff that's going on with him. And I think you have one over here. Thanks. Hi. You hide behind the bench over here. Nobody can see you on the screen. That's right. I'm hiding behind the column over here. Sorry, I lost my voice at my nephew's Sorry. wedding this weekend. <clears throat> it must have been uh, a big thing. It was. <laughs> it's a lot of cheering. Um, hi, my name is Don Gilpin, and I'm at uh, ASU's Cronkite School, so my question is mm -hmm. related to media. You mentioned that um, some of these pastors use YouTube to oh, disseminate yeah. their mm -hmm. message, mm -hmm. and I was wondering, my understanding is that there's pretty good um, internet um, yeah. access and distribution mm -hmm. in the main cities like mm -hmm. uh, Lagos and Abuja, mm -hmm. but out in the countryside, not as much. Not as much, yeah. And I was wondering to what extent you see if the role of social media in disseminating information mm -hmm. for political and religious conversation or forming groups is similar to what we see over here, if there are any differences. A little bit, yeah. There's a pastor that was there, and I'm, I'm blanking on the name right now because this is not the talk I was supposed to give, but that had been involved in a sex scandal, and I saw a lot of that on Twitter. I saw a ton of it on Twitter. So a lot moves on Twitter and Facebook. I think that what we have to think about in terms of that too, because I'm going to actually do, um, I'm working on something about marriage in the Nigerian context. So I'm really interested in these fabulous weddings. So that's just me because I'm, I read the wedding page in the New York Times all the time. But um, <laughs> anyway, I think what we have to think about is also the use of your cell phone. I mean, because a cell phone is now how most Africans get everything. It's not so much TV. When, you're, when your internet, when the electricity is going in and out, how do you watch something? You watch it on your phone. You, you, get your, you get your data and you get it and you're looking at it on your phone. And so that's a way to keep up with everybody. And so, you know, I, this, this talk was not about this, but uh, a man who has been really against these prosperity gospel preachers, Daddy Freeze, he uses Instagram to do live Instagramming to talk to all of his people, right? So he comes on Instagram and he has thousands of people watching him. He's actually started an online church this way. So that's, that was really interesting. And he turned the, uh, that's a good story. He turned the tables on me when I went to interview him. He had a, a young woman come in and she held the phone for an hour and a half and videotaped us. And literally we were up on YouTube in two hours. And he had edited it and turned it around and everything. And so I'm in awe of this, the, the ways they use social media and YouTube and things like that in you know, just a much faster way than people do here, you know, especially to get out these kind of religious messages. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions. I do want to give a pause for any students who do need to leave at this time. This would be a good this time your, to do this so. This is your break time. Uh, you are coming. invited to stay, I hope but you thank got you extra for. Credit. for uh, <laughs> if you didn't around. get extra credit, talk um, to your teacher. We'll go. Uh, if talk you do have professor. a <laughs> if you do have a question, please raise your hand so I can make sure we get you in the queue. We're going to go here, here, and there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. My name is Pat, Hi, Pat. and uh, you mentioned uh, history. You mentioned uh, traditional religion, and I hope anthropology is in there somewhere because that's what that's what my question goes yeah, yeah, to. Yeah. Um, many many years ago, 60, 61, I played a um, song most Americans of a certain age know from the I Love Lucy thing, Babalu Aye. Mm -hmm. And yes. I played it, it was from Cuba. Mm -hmm. And he said, Nobody oh, knew it was, that's, yeah. that's from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, it's not, it's from Cuba. He said, no, it's not, it's, it's from Nigeria. Sure. I can understand everything, blah, blah, blah. So then I was going to a Pentecostal church mm -hmm. and people were shouting mm -hmm. and all that. And mm -hmm. I was reading the anthropological literature and I saw mm -hmm. the African diaspora throughout, you know, Santeria, Candomblé, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. This pattern of worship, okay. Mm -hmm. Now you go back to Nigeria, the Pentecostals go to Nigeria. Do they, in their churches, shout or yes, have spirit possessed, get filled with the Holy Ghost, right? Yes, absolutely. They do all that. Do they recognize that that comes from their traditional religion? And I have yes. to answer this question in a very direct way. Yes and no. Because it's not supposed to come from a traditional religion. It's from God. It's from a different place. It's not from the gods, plural. It's from God and the Holy Ghost. 
right? Yeah. So yeah. this is not, and, and, and there's a lot of people, I mean, we didn't even get into this, but I mean, there's a whole talk I could give about demon possession in Nigeria mm -hmm. and deliverance ministries and all of this kind of stuff. And so they would look at that as, no, this is, this is not from, this is not from Ogun or Sh you know, Shango or somebody like that. This is, this is from the Holy Spirit. And whatever you're talking about, and this is what I'm talking about with the destruction of traditional religion. You know, Pentecostalism comes in and says, this stuff is from the devil. We got to get it out of you. And we're going to fill you with the Holy Spirit. And this thing is going to happen to you. And so you can shout and you can do all these other things. But I mean, yeah, I have a student right now who's working on Nollywood films. And he's, start, you know, he's starting off with the, the big film, Living in Bondage. And that's what living in bondage was all about. It's, it's, it's about you know demon possession and all this other stuff. And how do you have you know it's the Christian pitted against the traditional religion, all of this stuff. So yeah, they yeah no, that yeah the, the, the simple answer is they are not from the same place for Pentecostals. Hi, my name is Barbara Taft, and um, last August I spent. Uh, some time in Nigeria. I was in I was in Port Harcourt okay. and in Ogoni Land, okay. and there are tons of Pentecostals in that yeah. region. Um, one of the things that that surprised me in what you put up there was the percentage of Muslims mm -hmm. and the percentage of Christians. Mm -hmm. And it occurs to me that if the Pentecostals are encouraging people mm -hmm. so heartily to vote, mm -hmm. that theoretically, theoretically, if they wanted to put up their own candidates. Mm -hmm. Uh, and many of them do believe that mm -hmm. Buhari and some of the others mm -hmm. uh, among the Muslims are quite corrupt and yeah. might want to put up their candidates, that they might be able to win. What do you think about that? Well, I think that that's true, but I think there's also a historical piece that has to be addressed about how the nation was apportioned in terms of political power and activities and the way that the British cut it. The North just has more power. You know, this, this is the way it is. And so this is, that's a whole nother kind of weeds in, thing, but I'm gonna say it just like that as a, as a basic thing. And in the North, who's up there? Muslims. So this is, this is not gonna be as simple as, you know, we get some Pentecostals to run, they might get into power. That, 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 it's not gonna be that simple. And it's, it's about, it's, think about it as just like gerrymandering or how you cut something, how you cut political power in a nation and where it lies. And that was, you know, that's the British. Yeah, that's, think, a, that's a whole other semester class. I think probably the question of tribalism also enters into that. Yeah, but even but, but more so about colonialism and what happened with that. Yes, can you talk about that? Because you're the political yeah. scientist. You can talk about this better than I can. One constitutional issue in Nigeria is mm -hmm. for you to, to win the presidency, mm -hmm. you have to win at least 25% of the votes in two-thirds mm -hmm. of the states of the federation. There are 36 states in yeah. Nigeria. Yeah. And uh, more than uh, out of the 36 states, I think 19 or 21 are in the north. Mm -hmm. yeah, so see. you can put up all the Pentecostals. That's what you want. All mm -hmm. the Christians. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You also have to meet that geographical. You got to meet the. Yes, exactly. For Thank you. you. To win the presidency. Thank you for explaining that better. You, I said it right, but I just didn't say it as eloquently as you did. Uh, yes. Sorry. Thanks. Hi. Thanks for the uh, great lecture. Actually, my question uh, will not be much related to the political aspect of it, mm -hmm. but it is going to uh, be more about, like someone suggested, brought in the mm -hmm. uh, the point that uh, happened uh, that about President Kagame of Rwanda mm -hmm. requiring the pastors mm -hmm. in his country to have some level of certification before they can man the pulpit mm -hmm. and. Uh, you, your response to uh, to him seems not to be kind of okay in my own understanding, actually. Mm -hmm. And whereas in Nigeria, mm -hmm. what uh, the, the, the what I think is the main source of power, mm -hmm. I mean, before they can even uh, or for the pastors, before mm -hmm. they can even get some influence in the first place, mm -hmm. is the money that they collect at the tithes yeah, they collect yeah, from yeah, the tithes, congregation. Yeah. That's the main mm -hmm. source, actually. Oh, yeah. Even at the end of the day, if when they, uh, they get that kind of money mm -hmm. and they amass a lot of wealth uh, mm -hmm. and they you know, start establishing is institutions like mm -hmm. universities, in the case of Uyedipo, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you know, and if and even if, at the end of the day, the university has a lot of reputation, mm -hmm. and even uh, if it's, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the kids of mm -hmm. his congregation mm -hmm. might not even have enough 
money to be able to attend that kind of university. Nobody is bothered. And this is what is happening with other, most other pastors too. Yeah. So now the question now comes to the propriety and mm -hmm. the morality mm -hmm. of uh, you know, such venture yeah. that at the end of the day, they have, they get every uh, mm -hmm. naira and cover, mm -hmm. I mean, from their congregation, uh, which actually propelled them to such heights, mm -hmm. and uh, their congregation that made them to that, uh, kind of lift, lifted them to that height, cannot even benefit from it. Because, mm -hmm. you know, um, don't you think that by requiring, you know, pastors mm -hmm. manning the pulpit to have education, a, so edu education mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, they will be more able to, you know, be kind of, um, Better in the better kind in of, of messages. The I mean, because that's the, that that is this is what is happening. All it requires for anyone to be a pastor in Nigeria mm -hmm. now is for you to have some sound oratory mm -hmm. and be able to convince people. People that they can do. This. And okay. people so will I, start. I and they, 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 yeah. So so that's the I mean. So and, you're and asking we, me, what is the morality and, of all this? Of, why of, is, of, it, why is this happening? Because this is what yeah. is happening, and that's what that's the root of the of the problem. So if if President Kagame can make such, mm -hmm. and it's appearing kind of that is too dictatorial. Mm -hmm. But if you actually look at the goal, mm -hmm. where is, I mean, uh, to, 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 to uh, bring know, some sanity into the mm -hmm. system, don't you think that mm -hmm. is uh, the way to go? No, I'm gonna tell you why. Let me tell you why, I'm gonna use it from a very different perspective, okay? I'm not even gonna talk about Africa. I'm gonna talk about African Americans. When slavery happened and then we went into freedom, one of the only things that people could do was become a pastor. They didn't need an education. There weren't seminaries set up. There was nowhere for people to go. A pastor was one of the only few things that black men could do that was actually an honorable profession that they could preach and they could teach. And they might not even even know how to read. But then you had the establishment of denominations and all of these things like the National Baptists and everything else. And that became a whole thing. And people started getting educated. They started going to schools like Morehouse. They went to um, um, different schools to get educated. They went to Harvard Div. They went to Yale. They went to Vanderbilt. They went to all these different places, right? And people got education. But we still have people here in the United States, black, white, and other, who don't have an education and still preach and open up churches and get people every day, OK? That's kind of a democratic thing, right? Now, you have to separate that from the fact that these people are doing these kind of things and taking money from folks, OK? So what's interesting to me about Daddy Freeze in the Nigerian context is he's preaching against people who are taking all this money from people who don't have money, OK? So don't get it twisted about having education is going to make you stop stealing from people, because I'm going to promise you that it does not. <laughs> Actually, if you get an education, you might steal more money from people. Okay, so having a theological degree does not mean that you won't steal from people. It only means that you're trying to routinize what this thing is happening. And so in Kagami's case, I don't know all of this story. In Kagami's case where he's saying, I want you to be educated, where does he want them to get their seminary stuff from? Who's teaching them? What are you bringing in? Are you, are you sending them to a Calvinist seminary? Are you sending them to a Pentecostal school? Does it matter what schools? Pentecostals have opened up schools and started training people. So they could go there. So it, to me, the question is not about whether you get training or not, whether you can do this or not. It's the question is, are you, are you morally right about what you're doing? You know? And so this is, this is a way that, yes, I, I understand what you're saying. In the Nigerian context, I am clearly against that. That's why I'm interested in Daddy Freeze. I think what he's doing right now, I, I, I don't know that I say everything I like he does, but I think what he's doing right now to push back against this thing is very interesting that could actually become a movement. But, you know, unfortunately, this is what religion is all about, whether we're talking about Christianity or some other stuff. Anybody can say that they are a guru tomorrow and go get some people to follow them, and it turns out to be really bad. You know, think about Jim Jones. Think about this guru that just went to jail who raped women in India, who's in jail for the next 25 years. I can't, Ramjit Sin or whatever his name is, you know. It's, it's a thing. It's about corruption. You know, it's about the corruption that people do. And you can't stop people from following them. And so when, you know, this would be like if I'm in a classroom and my students are like, well, why are people doing this or whatever? I'm like, I'm going to always tell you I'm a religious study scholar. I study what people do. I might not personally like what I do, but this is what they do. 
And this is what we have to contend with. It's going on since day number two, since somebody figured out they could worship the sun. And like, you could get people to pay for that, you know? And then, you know, you could get them to leave offerings. And like, this is, this is transactional religion. It's what it is. And some people know how to get some transactions to get a legit, and other people just get transactions to get a nice house. <laughs> Uh -huh. Professor of Mathematics. Yes, yeah, see, Mathematics. I mean, he got, yeah, Professor of Mathematics. And he, uh, he counted the cash, right? Okay. Thank you. The, the, yes. The, the last word here. What Kagame is seeking to do is, mm -hmm. is to institutionalize religion. Yeah. See, and now that, people, that's interesting, too, yeah, right? Anyway, that's a problem. People will still anyway, but when you institutionalize it, you can hold people responsible. Yeah. But yeah. Where, the but who is going to be the who who is the who is the person is responsible at the top for when they do this? Yeah, so, who? So, so that is what we should be we should be thinking about now. That's because what I'm thinking about. It's a step in the right direction. Yeah. It's a step in the right direction. This so is my I'm, job. I'm giving a practical case mm -hmm. in the Catholic Church. Yeah. The challenges is faced with scandal. Oh well, look at uh, go. Let's not even go there. Yeah. If the church were not, if the church were not an institution, mm -hmm. who was going to be held responsible? For oh, but look look how long they went without doing it. You now you are stepping on the territory I really know. <laughs> <laughs> now we are going. What I really did. <laughs> All right, you're telling us where we shouldn't go. I'm going to tell you where you should go, which is out into the secret garden where we can take this conversation outside. You can finish it and settle things there. Uh, would you please join me in thanking uh, Anthea Butler for coming today? I'm glad I got everybody riled up.